Good afternoon. Welcome to our Facebook Live event today. We're so happy that you tuned in to be with us. Today we're going to learn about dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and hopefully get some great tips from Dr. Brody for our uh, most important people here today, our caregivers. I'm Laura Spradley. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Arkansas Geriatric Education Collaborative, which is a very big word. We just call ourselves AJEC. And I am with the Department of Geriatrics in the Reynolds Institute on Aging at UAMS. And with me today is Carolyn Torrance. Hey, hey Carolyn. Hey. And Carolyn is the um, Program Director for Alzheimer's Arkansas, our co-sponsor today. And we're so glad to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Laura. And I know Carolyn and I, we got to hear Dr. Um, Brody this morning, and we are so excited for y'all to be able to um, get to hear from Dr. Brody. And he is a very special guest from Florida. So we're praying that he gets out of here without any snow. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna give you just a brief bio on Dr. Brody. He is the founder of Brain Matters Research, one of the largest, most respected private clinical research facilities in the country, specializing in Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. He is nationally recognized expert in both Alzheimer's disease and stroke. Laura, we can't hear. I'm sorry, okay. They're having trouble hearing me. Uh, he is a former professor of neurology at the University of California, San Diego, and the stroke program director at Scripps La Jolla. He eventually relocated to Palm Springs County in 1995. He was the founding director of acute interventional stroke program at Bethesda Memorial Hospital, where he and his team conducted acute stroke clinical trials, seeking to optimize the time to treatment and for the outcome of stroke victims. Dr. Brody is diligently partnering with physicians and practitioners in the community to advance early detection of Alzheimer's disease at the primary care level. Through free memory evaluations and community lectures, he has increased public awareness of clinical trial opportunities and bringing us ever closer to the cure for this devastating disease. Welcome, Dr. Brody. Thank you. Thank you for being with us again and taking time out of your week to be here. We know so many people are affected by dementia and particularly you, our caregivers. So before we get started, Dr. Brody and Carolyn and I want everyone to know that what you are going to hear today is an educational program and it should never ever take the place of you having a conversation with your own doctor. Okay, so we just wanna get that out front there. For those of you turning, tuning in, we ask that you um, send your comments via Facebook and we'll ask Dr. Brody these questions and hopefully we can get through all of them during our session today. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off with a very simple question. Dr. Brody, could you please help us describe the term dementia to everyone out there today? All right, so dementia and Alzheimer's are not two different things necessarily. Uh, dementia is an umbrella term, and that means that people have trouble with their short-term memory and at least two of the other cognitive spheres, clarity of thinking, like language, um, which means coming up with the right words, visual, spatial, where, uh, construction, where did you park your car, calculations, emotions, judgment and your ability to do the things you normally do. And when that whole mishmash is getting worse over time, that's a dementia. And Alzheimer's type dementia is far and away the most common type of dementia. About 75% of dementias are Alzheimer's type dementia. There are other dementias, but Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. Okay. Well, thank you. It almost you. made sense, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so did I hear you say, are Alzheimer's and dementia the same? Well, they are. Alzheimer's is the general category. <laughs> and uh, dementia is the general category. And Alzheimer's type dementia is the Just, most common type of dementia. Okay. okay. Right. And there are about seven different dimensions? No, Did about I listen? 155. Uh, 150, 150, about 155 Ooh. types of wow. dimensions. Well, somewhere in between, between yeah. <laughs> there, there's um, it, about 10 dimensions are <laughs> Prevalent, well, yeah. common, but yeah. um, they, the, the top five, so 
Alzheimer's type dementia is about 70 75% then vascular dementia from little series of small strokes over time that accumulate and then there's something called Al Lewy body variant Alzheimer's a mishmash of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease and there's frontal temporal dementia and there's uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus and those are the kind of the big group and then down below would be uh, a, s a very small more rare group of dementias that you would teach to neurology residents in an academic setting but for for our purposes today that's kind of the bulk of it okay thank you okay this is the million dollar question are any of these dementias reversible yes so let's just be clear when when you go see somebody you know, uh, either the person or you bring a loved one to uh, a, a neurologist especially somebody who does this for a living we're trying to fix our first thought is can we find something that's fixable because when you when you go see a neurologist 15 to 20 percent of the time when people come to to see me and they've got problems with memory or the clarity of their thinking they've got something fixable reversible it can be related to their depressed and it looks like dementia it's called pseudo dementia they're having a reaction to medication or a combination of medications their thyroids out of whack their b12s out of whack their liver function their kidney function they've had some trauma there's a number of things that are potentially fixable including something called normal pressure hydrocephalus where the ventricles of the brain get enlarged and that's curable and so you'd never want to miss that and so i guess what i'm saying is if you're concerned you you can find out and we're not looking to give you a bad diagnosis we're looking for something fixable and then we don't find it then we when then we try to give you an accurate diagnosis and then try to figure out what what to do to help you from there okay thank you so how would someone actually get the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease right so basically uh, if the if that particular person is concerned mm -hmm. they'll come to see the doctor and they usually the most prominent complaint is I'm having trouble with my short-term memory uh, most of the time that's the first complaint not always but um, so then you have to address that so as people get older none of you people out there are here of course but as people get older you can get some normal brain aging some benign forgetfulness you go into a room you forget why you went there you don't remember an appointment it comes back to you but oh oh no oh, oh. <laughs> i didn't remember that but the point is this um you need to distinguish whether this is normal brain aging or something else is going on and then of course we want to look to see do you have anything that's fixable and that means are you depressed do you have uh, problems with your thyroid what medications are you on and then we would end up looking at a scan of your brain is there have you had a stroke or do you have a, a brain tumor what is the is there something that we can that we can say this explains your what you're complaining about and then we go through all that and once we rule out all the other fixable things then we can really hone in on what do we really think you have and we have very sophisticated tests to be accurate now and so the first step is coming through the door and saying I have I have some problems with my memory or something's not right that's usually when when caregivers loved ones come in they go but there's something wrong with Bob there's not something's not right and unfortunately the thing that brings people in is usually changes in behavior not so much memory because it's not not a problem but when there's changes in behavior that's time I got to take Bob to the doctor something something's not right so getting through that front door and 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 having a neurologist somebody who does this for a living systematically go through what are the possibilities and rule out things that are fixable and then be more precise about things that are not to make an accurate diagnosis that's the whole point okay thank you we have a question from the audience i'm going to read it so i get it correct i have an 82 year old husband was just diagnosed with cognizant impairment 
His memory has been slipping for a few months. We got the actual diagnosis last Friday. He will be I'm not, that's not a complete sentence. I'm going to skip. What tools do I need to help him with dates, appointments, etc.? He has begun physical therapy for his weakness and hopefully his strength will improve. He was diagnosed with CML, CMML about three years ago and has taken chemo once a month that may contribute to his chemo brain. I need to find a support group for those who are caretakers. What do I do now? Right. Well, the first thing is that these symptoms in somebody who has a, a cancer and getting chemotherapy may mean that they don't have a dementia per se, they mm -hmm. don't have Alzheimer's, they have a, a side effects from the chemotherapy. Okay. But irrespective, this, this uh, lady needs some tools to help her husband manage. Mm -hmm. And so there are a whole bunch of simple things like writing things down, cueing, um, you can write things down on the fridge. Um, and sometimes what I tell people is just whatever is important to them that day, just say, let's talk about it this morning and we're going to talk about it at noon and then at dinner time because sometimes I forget. Right? So a lot of times as caregivers and people who are trying to help their loved ones, subversion and a little bit of diabolical thinking is a good thing, right? Because mm -hmm. not addressing it until things are too far along is a bad thing. Okay, thank you. And we have another question. Jeff wants to know, what are the seven stages and how long does one spend in each stage? <laughs> okay, well, I'm not a seven stage person. The uh, Alzheimer's Association kind of came up with that. But basically stage one is you don't have any symptoms which only became a relevant category when we start doing prevention trials. So mm -hmm. People don't have any symptoms, but they have these abnormal proteins building up in their brain, so they're at risk. And then uh, one is where you have some mild memory problems that maybe the only the family knows. Nobody else would, would suspect that there's an issue. And then it goes on to phase three where other people recognize there are some problems and people, they may not be able to do all the things they used to do easily. Mm -hmm. And then phase four is, uh, stage four is just a more dramatic part of that, okay. um, where they have more trouble with activities, daily living, and five is when they start not to be able to manage, and driving may become an issue, mm -hmm. finances may become an issue. In six, it's gotten worse, they're not as mobile, they're not eating as much, and seven is really when people are, are not really communicative they're having trouble ambulating, and they're having trouble uh, eating and swallowing, and really, uh, things are really, that's end stage disease. Okay, thank you. The only reason that this is useful for me is if I tell somebody, most of the people I see have stage three or stage four Alzheimer's, once I've ruled out the other things, and I, if I tell them you've got stage four Alzheimer's, they say, oh my God, it's everywhere because they equate it to cancers. Cancer. So it's, it, it's useful and it, it means, has more impact. But other than that, I just say mild, moderate, and severe. Okay. So Dr. Brody, can we talk about communicating with someone with dementia and Alzheimer's? What, what skills or what advice would you give caregivers? Right, so there is no one size fits all. You, you all know uh, who you're dealing with and that person and so Let's be clear, this disease happens to a person, to the fabric of the person. So everybody's different. If you know one person with Alzheimer's, you know one person with Alzheimer's. So your approach to people has to be based on the person. So it has to be individualized. You know some people are, are gonna dig their feet in and they're not going to, they're gonna be in that river called the Nile, denial. And some people are gonna be open to, well, you know what, I, I, I saw this uh, community program where they check your memory and I'm a little worried about it. Do you want to come along? So that's the subversion. So while we're here and I'm getting my memory tested, maybe you want to get yours tested. Whatever it takes to actually get somebody to walk through the door and get assessed is legal. Right? Because <laughs> you have to get them through the door to get a checkup 
And that's the inertia, walking through the threshold of that door. Okay, so another thing about Alzheimer's and dementia, sometimes that it comes with a lot of symptoms and behaviors. So can you give the caregivers any suggestions for dealing with repetition and aggressive behaviors? You're right. Well, with respect to repetition, um, my advice is, you know, if the person didn't have the memory problem, they wouldn't ask the same questions over and over again. Let it go, right? It's, uh, and the behaviors, unless they're dangerous or they're safety issues, let it go. So what I tell people is this, if you're the caregiver, pretend you're the, you're the director of a play, but you're also in the play and you're on the stage with your loved one. Mm -hmm. So you see the duality of the situation that you're gonna react the same way where you get frustrated, they get resentful, and you get frustrated, they get resentful, and that whole thing escalates. When you start to see yourself as the director and realize there's no upside to that, even though there'll be times when you can't help yourself, it'll be a reflex, you will start to say it's not worth it and just back away and unless it has to do with safety. Okay. So we have a question from Emily. Is there a set of rules when to move your, your loved one into a care facility? And what do you recommend when looking for a facility? You're right, that's a good question. So um, there are no rules. In general terms, um, if you're not early, you're late. Mm -hmm. But most people are late because they don't they don't want to do it. And generally speaking, people do better at home. But the reasons that people need to be placed are that the caregiver is burning out, and usually they're burnt out before they realize they're burnt out. Yes. Or, or there's dangerous behavior, uh, or both, right? And so that's an individual. Uh, decision sometimes there's just no that caregiver a loved one has no resources right and 50 percent of the caregivers die before the patients extremely stressful my my dad died of alzheimer's two years ago terrible so i basically sit down and talk to the talk to the caregivers and every case is in, in uh, kind of an individual case but I like to plant the seed and say, no, I think things are going pretty well right now. How are you doing? Maybe down the line, it's worth thinking about getting some help in the house or maybe uh, there might be a, a better place for them and for you. And you just make that judgment when you get to know the people. And that's why primary care doctors who know you and your loved one, you can, you can uh, talk to them before you go in as a couple, mm -hmm. right? So that they they know what the situation is. It's very hard to do that in front of the person for the first time. So I have a lot of people call me up and say, Doc, can I see you for, uh, for about 10 minutes before he comes in? And we always, we figure out a way for, to make that happen. Great idea. Okay, we have another question. And this is from Gordon. What is the best approach to get a loved one to the doctor that is hesitant about having signs of dementia? Oh, well, we touched on that. <laughs> Being diabolical and subversive works for me. Uh, you, you have to do whatever you have to do to get them in. Uh, it's, but it's easier if you come up with something that makes sense and it's non-threatening and, you know, it, nobody, I, I, my wife hates doctors and uh, I think she tolerates me, but <laughs> a lot of people don't like going to doctors and they don't want to hear what they're afraid you're going to tell them. So basically I talk about, well, how are you doing with your memory? How are you functioning? I don't start, I, I never go to the word Alzheimer's. It takes, it takes a lot of work to get to that point where I think this is the diagnosis and I do this for a living. So I usually end up saying, you know what? I think you have enough of a memory problem that it's worth looking into. And step by step, that nice. usually works. Okay. 
Okay, and another question. How important are the Alzheimer's drugs after a person is diagnosed? Well, well the good news and the bad news. The good news is that you do get some bang for your buck early when you use these medicines, but they're symptomatic treatments. They don't get to the heart of what's actually happening in the brain. Mm -hmm. So they, they work a, uh, a little while um, early and then they're still better than nothing, but as the disease progresses, they're a little like spitting in the wind, um, and it's more marketing then. It's, but and, and this, there's only four drugs out there, and, and I and many other people in the field did that research. So if there's a window where you may get some benefit early, you should use that early. But there's gonna be a point in time where there's diminishing returns because of, you know, what's happening is the brain cells are degenerating. There's nothing for those medicines to really plug into. Okay, very good. Well, going back to um, Carolyn's, obviously very concerned about caregivers, and we all are, but she, in her program, um, Carolyn, what are some things that you have available through Alzheimer's Arkansas that, that caregivers could reach out to you? Or? So first I want to say there are a number of resources out here. Of course, Laura, UAMS and, <laughs> and your department, <laughs> like they provide workshops and training for the unpaid caregiver, family caregivers, which is really important because a lot of times when we step into caregiving, we think we know what we're doing, but shortly afterwards, we figure out we kind of don't. So they do have uh, great programs and workshops, and the UAMS have centers on aging across the state. Uh, we There's CareLink. They provide in-home care services. They provide uh, Meals on Wheels, Companions. So there are a lot of resources. At Alzheimer's Arkansas, we provide financial assistance. We provide support groups. Uh, just again, just a resource for caregivers uh, who are taking care of their loved ones with Alzheimer's and dementia. And hope for the future. And hope for educational <laughs> workshops. Hope for the future. And our grants provide respite care to loved one, which Dr. Brody had touched on, is very important because the caregiver is really, I call them the second patient to Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question. Have 10, uh, Jeff is asking, what kind of activities would you recommend for Alzheimer's patients to stimulate brain activity? Oh, well, that's a good question. It depends on the person because, you know, um, I had, uh, I, I had a gentleman in a study and he was staying overnight, so it was a phase one trial. And um, he was uh, walking around a circle, we have a big institute, and going to the coffee machine and drinking coffee. And he, three o'clock in the morning, he was beside the, the bed in a chair, bent over, and I said, Morris, let me help you into bed. And he wasn't, he wasn't a half asleep. He had a little pencil and he, and he was working on this in this book and he looked at me and he said Sudoku right but learning something new is important because mm -hmm. that those pathways are like branches that you're getting you're you're creating new connections mm -hmm. so the things that you're already good at aren't the things you want to spend a lot of time it's learning new, new things. things but it's got to be things that you have an interest in doing it can't be homework so that depends on the person Okay. I know Carolyn, I heard you earlier today talk about prevention. Ah. Is there anything, can we take a pill? Mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> but if you're a caregiver, you can take a sleeping pill. <laughs> um, no, you know, basically, uh, I wrote a book about prevention in there, there's no absolute prevention because it's a disease of aging and in, in, for the most part, but people do get the disease in their 50s, right? Mm -hmm. So and that's highly genetically loaded. There's not an easy way to prevent that. But as people get older, there's a lot of risk factors that are modifiable that are the same risk factors for stroke. So high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, um, try to avoid head injuries, try to avoid my cousin. You haven't met my cousin, but it wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> there, are, there are things that, uh, that you can try to do to optimize your lifestyle. So the Mediterranean diet, exercise. It turns out that exercise, aerobic exercise, 
when you do that, it, if you stimulate a brain derived nerve growth factor and you actually, even as you age, even with the disease, you do make new brain cells and you can accelerate that with exercise. Oh, wow. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Brody. We do have audience members and caregivers here. <coughs> Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. I, I sent a question in this morning, but I probably didn't do it right. But That's my right. question is, Dr. Brown, is there um, anything that you can recommend to a caregiver who is faced with um, every night almost sundowners? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, let me repeat the question in case I couldn't hear. The question was, is there anything you can do to help with sundowners if, there, if you're a caregiver? Right. So let's just talk about what this kind of euphemism of sundowning means. It, 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 when people, uh, when the stimulus of the normal milestones of the day are over and then it's darker out, that's the euphemism, um, then people tend to get more confused and disoriented. One is to keep the lights on. Two is to have a routine at night so that it just doesn't peter out because when things aren't happening in a structured way, then the mind starts to wander and things get distorted. Um, and then sometimes, despite best efforts, then uh, you, people need medication. And so it really depends on doing all the things you can do to try to avoid that, but sometimes be people become very belligerent and they get uh, you know, verbally and physically abusive. They'll have hallucinations, delusions, paranoia. So it just really depends on how bad is it. And so that you have to talk to your doc and talk about what can you do from a behavior point of view, structure things at home, and then when is it time to talk about medication? Thank you. Any other? Any other questions? So let's talk about some of the things we do at Alzheimer's Arkansas. First, you can look on our website at www.alz. Look at me, I forgot. <laughs> normal <about>? aging. <laughs> www.alz.org. <laughs> So we provide resources to caregivers across the state. So it does not matter if you live in the far left corner to the bottom right corner, we are there. We have nine educational workshops free to caregivers across the state. Our first one is in Little Rock, Hope for the Future, Friday, March 8th. We provide lunch and all kinds of resources and we have doctors there to take your questions, financial people there to take care of your legal needs. So please come out, it's at Geyer Springs Baptist Church. And on our website, we have all the information. Again, we also have support groups across the state. At this time, about 59. So if you're looking for a support group, we have those as well. And respite care. Respite care is very important. And we're here at Pulaski High United Methodist Church today, and they provide respite care to caregivers on Thursday. Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday. see? Today. Tuesday, you today. Forgot. Normal <laughs> aging. So, and there's also a church in North Little Rock that provides it, St. Luke's as well. Mm -hmm. So there are many resources, and Laura has a wealth of information as well to help caregivers. You can also call us or look at our website, which is www. <laughs> Normal aging. <laughs> it's contagious. A G E C dot U A M S dot E D U. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Okay. We're right. I've got one. Mr. George. Uh, in past experience in working with all kinds of patients in this program here, a person would come in one week and he would be fine. And then the next week he'd come in and he would be ballistic. And I finally found out, you know, I asked, I'd call her caregiver and say, have you changed their medications? And lots of times they had. So has that changed any in the past few years? Well, let me just, uh, let me just say the most, the, the most common reason that there's a lot of variability is because of the diseases like that. So it doesn't have to be a change in medications. Sometimes it's a change in environment. So when, when people are at a certain point, they're a little brittle as far as coping with any changes. And if they went on a family trip or 
they went on a cruise or something. It's like shaking up a snow globe, and it can take a few weeks for it to settle back to where it was. Um, the other thing is that the disease starts off sort of slowly, and it's mostly sunny with intermittent cloudy periods. And then it's got in sunny with uh, intermittent storms. storms. <laughs> and then it, it really is, it's mostly cloudy and stormy with intermittent sunny periods. And unfortunately near the end, it's just storming. So it depends on where you're in and that weather pattern. And sometimes there's no rhyme or reason. When my dad had it, and my mom would say, are you sure he has Alzheimer's? He's so good now, right? Which would last for three or four days. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, when 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 somebody changes your diaper even if you're a national expert in something they don't believe you i would tell my mother something in stroke or alzheimer's and she would listen diligently and then she would say oh, what do you know <laughs> <laughs> so it also depends where where the where the advice is coming from okay. so linda has a question her mother has alzheimer's disease and uh, she has become OCD. Is that common? She puts on like five parasites. Yeah, it is, it is common. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a big part of the brain, a big part of the central nervous system is saying no. We say no a lot. A big chunk of our brain is there to say no. But when uh, the brain function is impaired, that say no part starts to go away. And so when you have an impulse, you, you just go after it. So you get obsessive compulsive disease. And people will pick at their skin, um, they'll take clothes off and on. There'll be a whole bunch of kind of rituals. And it's not uncommon, and you have to decide whether you, the treating it with a medication is gonna be worse than the symptoms, but when people are picking at their skin and they're getting infections and they have to go on antibiotics, once you've tried, why don't you try wearing mitts and that's not working, then sometimes me medication is needed. You don't have any choice. Okay. Looks like we have time for one last question. This is from Jeff. Can you explain the differences and advantages of an MRI versus a CAT, oh, versus a PET scan? So there was three choices, sorry. There. Wow. Yeah. Jeff's very prolific He's today. Got good <laughs> questions. Okay, so an uh, uh, MRI scan is a magnetic scan of the brain that looks at anatomy. So it just looks at all the lobes of the brain. It doesn't tell you how well each part is looking. Is working, it just tells you does it look normal. A CT scan, a computerized axial tomography, that's mm -hmm. what it stands for. <laughs> Cat scan <laughs> is part of a can be part of a PET scan. I know there's cats and pets, pets. and dogs, but the PET scan stands for positron emission transaxial tomography. I had to say that just so you know that I did this. But what it means is you can actually give tracers uh, that bind blood sugar or look and bind uh, amyloid or tau, which are the abnormal proteins that are the culprits of the disease. And then when you take the pictures, they light up like light bulbs. So you can actually confirm a diagnosis. And so that's actually looking at specific abnormal proteins, whereas MRIs and regular CAT scan are just looking at anatomy. So you're looking for, does somebody have a brain tumor? Have they had a stroke? Is there bleeding in the brain? Are they on a blood thinner? So you're looking for those things. But when you want to get more specific, then you're doing these PET scans to look for function of the brain or tag specific abnormal proteins that are the hallmarks of this disease. Okay. I promise we'll let you go. I know you told us at lunch, but those tests that you're talking about, they're not paid by Medicare right now, right? They are not. Or any insurance. Or any. No, but, uh, but the amyloid PET scan, where you look at one of these proteins, is FDA approved. Just nobody pays for it yet. We, we have done some pilot studies where Medicare will pay for it, but it's coming. The problem is Medicare have said, well, if you don't have a treatment, why would we spend the $3,000 to pay for it? And, and there is a point, but you know, we're gonna have to make the diagnosis early if we're gonna actually start treating people. So it's, it's a catch-22. And it's, where I think we're on the cusp, I wanna be hopeful here because I think we'll have a, our first 
uh, breakthrough drug approved probably within the next two to three years. Things are, we are making some headway. That's good to hear, Dr. Wood. That's great news. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you have any final thoughts or anything you could think of that we God, missed? final thoughts? That's a little <laughs> no. pessimistic. Uh, uh, he's <laughs> full of them today. We've had all yeah. these puns. Yeah. And <laughs> he's a comedian. He's a comedian well. on the yeah. side. <laughs> no, you know what? I think you, you guys have a great program here. I would just say that my goal would be to put myself out of business and all of you all out of business. Mm -hmm. So, but until then, we just have to do what we have to do. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Brody, again, um, for being here. And I know y'all have appreciated his thoughts today. Um, and Carolyn, thank you so thank much you, for Laura, being for my co-host and speaker. Um, like we've said, we gave you our websites, but we want to do them again. The Alzheimer's Arkansas website is www.alz ark.org or our website at UAMS is agec.uams.edu and we all we both of us combined have a variety of free programs to help and if we don't have one we'll find a way yes, to help will. you with anything you want to call us about um, I do want to wrap up and tell you that this program was co-sponsored by the Arkansas Geriatric Education Collaborative of the UAMS Institute on Aging, the Department of Geriatrics, and AJEC is funded through a Health Resources and Services Grant, and the UAMS Institute on Aging has seven other centers throughout the state, as Carolyn mentioned earlier as well, and Alzheimer's Arkansas is all over the state. So combined, we will get you a resource, the services, the services that you need. We can't thank y'all enough for tuning in, and for those of you that came in person, we thank you very much. Thank you.